So, and for the next talk, we have Timo Nussbaum with us remotely, and he'll be talking about using the Neo's event sourcing in Symfony with a bridge. And Eric, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm a bit happy to go back from the client to the server side. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it because the last year I've heard that it's actually possible to use many uh, packages in Symfony. Uh, from the flow world. So yeah, that is cool. It sounds like collaboration to me. Yeah, I, I also think that this would be a very interesting topic. And so without further ado, give a big round of applause for Timo Nussbaum. So welcome to my talk about event sourcing in Symphony with a bridge. Uh, nice to meet you in real life, not online. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say, but Corona had different plans. so. Therefore, this presentation is remote. I'm sorry for that, but yeah, I already downloaded the conference app. So please feel free to ask any question that you have and I'm going to answer it after the talk. Important things first, I'm going to take you with me on a journey that ends up in a lunch break. That's really cool. You cannot imagine a more beautiful end, right? My name is Timo Nussbaum and I'm working for a real small company directly in the heart of Stuttgart. It's called Evia. We develop a container shipping app that handles the logistics between China on the one side and Europe on the other and China and the US. On the voyage over of a ship over the ocean, a lot of different things can happen. On the current screen, you see, oh, sorry, not on the current screen here. That's the current screen. On the current screen, you see one of several problems our customer had. A lot of my team members started to sweat at that time because of the just-in-time production that had led to major problems. Hopefully, I think you, anyone read something about the ever given in the newspapers. Normally, this ship should pass the Suez Canal, but something went terribly wrong here. And yeah, I always say we don't want to be agile, but we have to. This is a roadmap. If you leave this session, you should have learned the following topics. First, the basic structure and idea behind CQRS and event sourcing. Second, an understanding how the brand new Symphony adapter works. And third, parts of the NEOS event sourcing that helps us to understand the main topics. Each topic, I also call it section, has its own icon. You can always see them in the higher right corner. If you have already dived deep into event sourcing, then yeah, you can breathe through the first intermediate steps. We are located in the understanding section at the moment. Before we start our journey, I want to map Symphony out a little bit. The idea is not mine, of course, Last year, I attended the Symphony Online Conference 2021. I list, listened to a talk by Dennis Bruman and Christian Floatman. They grouped the Symphony components into four layers. They discussed common principles for components. It's, it's more or less based on package design principles. They distinguish between core features, utility features, application features, and last but not least, framework features. The map shows us which components we can use standalone and which we can't. If you ask perhaps yourself why Neos doesn't use the messenger component from Symfony, yeah, well, it's pretty hard to set up this component standalone. This knowledge helps us to build better applications. Hopefully, a better symphony adapter. F, after all, that's our main goal. We have not left the section yet. Still move right forward in the understanding area. Before we start to build our adapter, I want to look into dependencies. Neos event sourcing uses already two symphony components. This doesn't cause us any grief, but we have to find a solution what we want to do with a flow job view. I don't know, 
Does anyone use the flow chart do already? I mean, it's something like you have a chart, you put it in the in a database like MySQL, and later you consume it. That, that's really easy. So how how can we handle that? In a, in the first step, I try out if we can use the Symphony Messenger or the process component instead. This could work because this component do the same or more or less the same. Furthermore, we need something for event dispatching because the event store definitely has to publish events later. In the documentation about the Symphony event dispatch that you can read, the component provides tools that allow you application components to communicate with each other by dispatching events and listening to them. Yeah, that, that sounds great. I'm going to grab it. So now that we have all the parts together, we can start now. So that's the big picture. And of course, after starting, it's, it's really important to, to take the first break because it's always you have to do that. So in the next slides, I have some overlap with Sebastian's talk. Sorry for that, but it's important. And hopefully you all saw the talk from Sebastian two, two hours before. But without explaining the CQRS pattern, command, query, responsibility, segregation. We cannot use this silver bullet that solves all our problems. In a talk, Gregory Young said, SQL S is simply the creation of two objects where there was previously only one. The separation occurs based upon whether the methods are a command or a query. Okay, a command, is a request to perform an action that changes the state. Commands are imperatives, like go to Neo's conference, bring me some beer. A command never ever returns any data. I tried that out with my children and uh, this, this uh, CQRS and I told them, clean up your room. And yeah, it, it doesn't work. There was always a response. And so perhaps the, the pattern is not 100% bulletproof. Okay, back, a query returns data, but it's not allowed to change the state of the object. What is the benefit of the separation? Okay, independent scaling, optimized read models. You can use different database technologies. For a read model, you can use Elasticsearch, you can use Redis, you can do whatever you want. And of course, separation of concerns and so on and so on. In the center of our beautiful picture, you see the asynchronity barrier. The barrier is really, really important. Uh, Sebastian uh, told you something about it, but just keep this barrier in mind. I'm coming to come back to it soon. The right side. Yeah, let's start with the easy part of an easy pattern, the right side. We already know that commands are imperatives, there are requests that change the state. For example, create a new block. Commands are normally processed once. Events describe something that has happened. In our case, block was created. An event is something like a modification. Event should be named in the simple past. The event is committed and published to an event bus. Back to our adapter. We want to use Neo's event sourcing with Symfony Write. Okay, our first task will be to create a config file in our Symfony application with the following name, Nias underscore event sourcing channel. The config provided the possibility to use different event stores. For each store, you have to define the event table name, that's MySQL on a normal table, and the transport. I would suggest you start with the console command transport. It's a lightweight implementation. So, next. So, now we are on the read side. Back to the understanding section. On the read side, we have some subscribers who listen to events that are published on the right side. It sounds easy. The subscribers greet projections out of this published events. Afterwards, you can query these new projections. 
you remember the important barrier between the write and read side. Now it's time to deal with it. Keeping the projections up to date. Normally, a event is appended to the stream and the read model gets updated afterwards. You see it right on the bottom. The time it takes to update the read model is known as the inconsistency window. But that's part of another story. We have two possibilities to update the read model. We can do it synchronously and asynchronously. Yeah, spoiler, because Sebastian already shown the preferred way to go in this talk. The biggest advantage of updating asynchronously is that you can scale and replay the events independently. If you update the events synchronously, you lose these benefits. And it, it's not really easy to build a transaction around your write and read model. So that's not the way you should go, definitely not. But please don't underestimate the effort for eventual consistency and the delivery guarantees especially to implement a good solution for the delivery guarantees can let to, or lead to a huge effort. That's really important. So we decide to update the read model asynchronously. Alexei Tsimarev, hopefully I, yeah, I don't know if it's Tsimarev or Tsimarev, wrote in his book, the most common implementation for client-side projections is to use catch-up subscriptions. The term catch-up comes from the fact that such subscriptions, when first connected to the server, will read all the historical events and then automatically switch to real-time event processing. That's what he wrote. And yeah, but beside the catch-up subscriptions, the persistent subscriptions, also known as competing consumers, are really popular. Kafka use it. Azure Event Hub use them. But because News Event Store use the catch-up subscription, I won't into any more detail about competing consumers. But the main difference is the checkpoint ownership. Normally, I would say we can discuss this topic later at the bar or in the venue, but that seems to be impossible at the moment, but write something in, uh, in the chat if you want to know more about it. So back to the catch-up subscriptions. Here we see two typical streams in the order A1 stream, an order was created. The customer added the product, searched for another product, and yeah, also added it to the basket. During his search for the second product, another customer created an order and so on and so on. That, that's easy. Under the two streams, you see the all stream. The all stream is something, it's something like a global stream. It means that every new event gets appended to this stream. Okay, we learned that the catch up subscription will read all the historical data or events first and switch them to real time processing. In our current example, the subscription created the document when the order created event came in. The later incoming events only update this document. On the replay, we flush delete this document and replay all the events. That the theory, let's look into the NEOS event store. Normally, yeah, I would see smiles on your face because that's code. And this guy, it took around 10 minutes or 15 minutes before he show some code. And that's really awful. But yeah, you see here the code out of the Neos event listener. You see that the listener used the catch up subscription. After the event store is applied, the function reserved the highest applied sequence number. You see it on letter, letter A on the screen. If no event has been applied, the number is minus one, letter B, that's up in the replay function. In the next line, the stream name is set. You remember the all stream. If the event listener is not an instance of stream aware event listener interface, then the all stream is used. That's letter C. Otherwise, a static functions listens to stream is called. 
Afterwards, the event store loads the event stream by the stream name and the minimum sequence number. That's letter B. That sounds a little bit strange, but uh, not really. The events committed on the right side to the stream. The first sequence number of an event is now. At that time, yeah, there's no read models exist. So the highest applied sequence number is minus one. That's letter B. The catch-up subscription is called the first time. Afterwards, the event store loads the first event. That's the event with the sequence number now. That's it. So we come now to the most, most important uh, screen in my presentation. If I have done a really good job, then after this screen to understand everything, and that's cool. If not, yeah, I don't want to, to think too much about that. So we have lost a little bit the side of our real goal because I told you a lot about CQRS, the underlying idea. We know a lot about the different subscriptions, event streams, and so on and so on. But at the end, we want to develop a, an adapter that we can use in Symfony. It's time to bring all these individual pieces together. To auto-wire the NEOS event store, that was really easy. We only had to register the store to the Symfony dependency injection container. That's a dependency injection container. Afterwards, we can commit an event to the store. The store itself publishes an event. So far, so good. But we have not dived deeper into the event publisher, a Symfony event publisher yet. The publisher is something like a wrapper. Everybody knows it from typo, typo 3. There, everything was a wrap on typo 3. Inside, it used the event dispatcher component from Symfony for resolving the class name of the listeners. What happens here? We have different listeners that listen if a new event is published that you see in letter A, that are the listeners. If that is the case, the event dispatcher get the listeners of the event and triggers an asynchronous transport to inform the listeners. That's letter B. The adapter can use the messenger or the process component as transport. We come to the different transport soon. Let's assume that we use the process component, a new subprocess asynchronous called the catch up subscription. This subscription built read models out of our projectors. Let's look together in the main functions. We are in the adapter section. That's part of the code of the adapter. Here you see the brand new Symfony event publisher. The Symfony event dispatcher is listened to by the subscribers, which has incoming events. That's the first line. If that is the case, a subprocess with a listener's class name and event store ID is called. The rest should be clear. So now it's time to come to the different asynchronous transport that you can use with the adapter. So Perhaps you, you know the sky on the, on, the, on the screen, that's Walter. And it's, it's first about entering a wall of pain. Some years ago, a developer told me, if you, if you really like pain, please try out Cake PHP. Yeah. And two years ago, I had to write a feature for a monolith with Cake PHP. Mm, honestly, yeah, Cake PHP, is, is, it's really not a pleasure because it was Cake PHP version 2.10, that, 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 that's really old. But a wall of pain? If you're a real tough guy, try to use a Symfony Messenger as a transport. For me, one of the biggest components of Symfony, and it's coupled really deeply to the core of Symfony. You can do everything and nothing with it. The component is delivered with a lot of different transport. AMQP transport, Redis transport, Amazon SQS, and a lot of more. You need your own transport, that's not a problem. You can implement it really, really easily. I wrote an Azure service bus transport for our current project. 
out of the box, the messenger can also handle retries and failures. That sounds, yeah, it, it sounds really great. So why I don't want to use it or why I normally, yeah, not my preferred way to, to use the messenger component is, yeah, if you go with your truck to the bakery, then you are the right guy to use a Symfony Messenger because the devil is really here in the details. Infrastructure tests are really a nightmare, nightmare with this component. The configuration is wired deep into the Symfony core, so I wrote a lot of workarounds to set, an, set up an acceptable test case for infrastructure tests. Okay, let's go to the next transport. That's the adapter with the Symfony process. So, do you know this guy, perhaps? That, that, that's Elliot uh, from the series Mr. Robot. It's a, it's a hacker, a genius, a really god-like man. It's, it's really cool. Using the Symfony process feels yeah, a little bit like Elliot has developed it. A lightweight alternative to a Symfony messenger. You uphold the async barrier and minimize consistency window that, that's really cool that's always my first choice of a transport of course there's also negative side you are not able to scale retry and failure handling are much more complicated than with the messenger so last slide before we get, get go straight forward to the case study robert lamke i, I met robert lamke I, I think seven years ago in switzerland it was one is first workshops about flow 1.0 and that's a, little, it's a long time ago and he told me that it took him around two weeks to implement property and check in flow since i work with symphony i only use the constructor injection because symphony normally use always the constructor injection if you are going to look into the neos event sourcing package you will not find the flow property injection. That is, friendly speaking, really, really cool. Because if you want to use a component standalone, the property injection is a, it's, it's a real pain. If I could have one wish, please don't couple Neo's features too tightly to the framework, because then all the Symfony guy can use it, the Laravel guy can use it, and all the other PHP developer too. And that, that would be really, really great. So you heard a lot of dimensional consistency. I have here a, a small, small story about dimensional consistency. Perhaps has anyone seen the movie The Big Lebowski? Perhaps the film is uh, about the dude uh, back east going burn out, mistaken for a millionaire of the same name. One of the main characters, Walter Subject, the main with uh, this, this the guy with a gun in his hand. A typical white American, um, he loves perhaps his gun more than anything else. The other guy with a bowling ball is called Piesos. And when the team of Piesos committed a rule violation, and, and to be honest, I, I didn't know that you can uh, commit a rule violation in bowling, but it seems to be possible. Walter took out his gun and told them that they are entering a wall of pain now. We know that. These two characters don't like each other, I think. So back to our problem, back to our screen. Be creative. What might happen in the situation? That you dropped a score of one. The refugee, the, the girl on the top. So search for the cowboy, in our case, the protection. Before she found him at the bar, of course, because the cowboy is always in the bar, Yasus saw that the you finished his turn and asked the cowboy protection about the score. The cowboy told him the score for now. Yasuo screamed out that his team won and so on and so forth. What exactly happened here? It took time for the refu refugee to find the cowboy. This period is known as the inconsistency window. And this time the score might be not up to date. The inconsistency we know led to an unattractive situation. Hopefully, water is not your customer, right? Data can be stale. Stale doesn't mean inconsistent. It's just not exactly up to date. Being conventional constants allow a system to be scalable. Mind the gap. 
Try to minimize the inconsistency window. Talk to your customer. What is an acceptable inconsistency time for them? That's, that's really important. So now I can start with a case study from our current project. So on our current project, we develop for a big international retail company. They own a container shipping app that handles the logistics between uh, Europe, China, US, I already told it, and on the journey of a ship over the ocean. A lot of different milestones have to be reached. So load, you have to unload something, some taxes, something like that. These milestones of a container were held in a graph. And that's, in our case, a read model. On the screen, I took out three milestones of the graph. A sunny day on the sea, container arrived in Rotterdam, and containers unloaded. You see a simple direct graph with thumb edges. The milestone container is unloaded two outgoing edges. We need these edges because we have to auto-resolve some milestones from time to time. So if the container is completely unloaded on the harbor, for example, then the unresolved milestone, a sunny day on the sea, see, it's, it's, it's not really possible anymore. So we have to auto-resolve this milestone. The auto-resolved milestone can also resolve other milestones. So you have more edges and that's it. If we receive a container's unloaded event, it can end up in three different events. So far, so good. But yeah, what does this have to do with eventual consistency? Yeah, a lot. And you see in the next screen, uh, we learned that eventual consistency leads to inconsistency window. We also learned that we should minimize this window. And But how can we avoid, and that, that's really important, unwanted results from a not exactly updated graph? The, the, the answer is really easy. You have to score the three version in your read model. The two incoming events, container is unloaded, and container arrived in Rotterdam, queried the graph protection and got beside a lot of properties, a stream version of one that you see in letter A. Afterwards, both events handle their tasks and eventual subtasks. Then container arrived in Rotterdam, finished earlier and committed to the store. That's letter B. The new stream version of the graph protection is too long, so that's easy. The other event, container is unloaded, try to commit to the store, but ends up in an error. The event store checked against expected version and threw an error. So far, so good. Yeah, not, nah, yeah, that's good, but not really. You have to think about what you want to do with the failed event. Perhaps you can throw it uh, event back to a queue or and try to process it later, but yeah, you have to think about that. So one more thing about catch-up subscriptions. In our case, we have a lot of different container streams. To be exact, I think it, it's more 100,000 different streams. Performance and scaling are really important for us. And of course, it's really important for, for everybody, not only for us. Out of the box, the catch-up subscription, use the all stream. You can imagine how long a replay of all the events will take with 100,000 containers. You want to go on holiday? Yeah, perhaps. But, but please start the replay first. But we want to replay only one container stream. So container one or container two, whatever. If you look in the catch up subscription again, there is a stream aware listener interface that allows you to define an own static function, listens to stream. That's, that's pretty cool. And you only have to implement the interface in your listener. What do you think? You, can you replay one stream now? It's possible. Yeah, in, in, in my case or in our case, not really. Listens to stream method is static. Of course, you can use reflection or static property to pass in the correct container stream, but that leads to different problems in the applied events log. We are here at the conference at the moment. Um, 
There's no better place to solve such issues. A lot of core developers are around for discussion, solutions, and many more. And I, I, I had already the discussion with Bastian Weidlich, and, and he told me that in the next release of the event store for Neos, uh, I can do that. So that, that's really cool. Okay. Something here, you see, there's something, something to read. There are some books, and I'm really, really old, and so my preferred way is to read books. And here are some books about COQRS and uh, a version in an advanced source system. But what I want to go here now is a little bit in, uh, hopefully you see the, uh, the local host at here now. Um, because that's the uh, demo, the small demo. And you see here blog comments and users. And if I go to users, you see here that that's me. And or we can create a user, for example, here in the demo, like um, Neos conference. And then email neos at neos.io, for example. And then we create a user. So that's demo, and if you look now in PHP, my admin, uh, hopefully I know the password. Yeah, that's that's a typical, uh, that's a typical, that's an event store. And you see now we have here a user was created. We have here the metadata, we have the payload. We can look into the payload and then you see, okay, the payload with the ID, the name, the mail. By uh, we have here the different event stores. That's an event store with the block event store. Um, yeah, that, that's the possibility to, to play around with it. So that it's not only a talk and uh, you're not able to, to test it. You see what happens here with events and uh, on the screen, you can see here there's a screen, okay, with only one event. This was use of what's created. But if you said, okay, we're, we want to add a, this news conference to news conference two, for example, and update the user again. And now I would expect that we have now a news, another event. And yes, here you have a user was updated event. So I think it's, it's, it's a good idea to play around with it a little bit. And that's it. Back to my presentation. And then I, I want to say thank you for this guys, especially Sebastian, because he developed a big part of the adapter. I want to thank Willem because Willem is my English teacher since some years, and that, that's really a pain. And Thomas that looks a little bit with me into the screen, screens here. I want to say thank you that you listen to to this um, talk, and hopefully you use the Symfony adapter in the future. If not, then hopefully you understand a little bit more about CQRS and event sourcing. And yeah, thank you very much and open for questions, of course. Thank you, Timo. Thank you very much. Yeah, event sourcing is a hard topic to get your head around, but I guess you explained it really well. So thanks again for that. <laughs> And let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Um, there are no questions currently, but uh, Timo already communicated his email address, and I think we can find you in the new Slack as well, if we have any, any yeah, more questions. Course. Yeah, I, I, may, I may have one question, because, yeah, um, thinking about this eventual inconsistency, um, I was wondering how to, how to mask it, right? So is, is there a common way or a common practice that you can mask this, this eventual inconsistency to the user? Yeah, you, you can. That, that's a really hard topic. Um, I, I don't mess it uh, in a time frame, but uh, what we have done um, is we've run Elasticsearch and we've around 1.5 million updates in our Elasticsearch index each day. And we do a CQRS pattern and um, we use Kubernetes and what you can do, our customer said, hey, come on, it took too long to update the Elastic Index. So uh, we run at the moment uh, five 
apps in parallel to update the index. So um, of course you can mess and say, okay, if we have around uh, too, too many updates and we can mess, it's too, too long to, to update the index. And then you can uh, mess this and then you can say, okay, we scale then the, the, the application that updated this index. And we have not done it at the moment, but that's all one of a big ticket in, in our company that we scale it automatically so that we say, okay, we, we, we look how long it takes to, to update and if it takes too long because there are too many requests, then we scale it up with Kubernetes. And that's one big task at the moment. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot. And yeah, give a big applause once again for Timo Nussbaum. Thank you. So I'm really, uh, it's, it's really sad we can't give you your gin uh, present, <laughs> but I guess we will we will do this anytime later. Yeah, and we also have two announcements. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come to Dresden in uh, in four weeks, so so we'll <laughs> cool, cool it for you. Perfect. Okay. <laughs>